Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who, through faith in God, will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Hebrews chapter 11. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11 if you would. We're going to pick back up in our series, Faith to Change Your World. Believe it or not, we're already up to part nine in this series. We're just going through the understanding, first of all, of what we started off with and talking to you about faith of two key things. We got to know what faith is biblically, what God defines it as. And I'll tell you, the reason it's like, well, pastor, this is a lot of definitions for faith because faith is like a diamond. You can turn it just a little bit and see another facet of it. Faith is, is so beyond context of, of any type of a confined description as we see clearly from the Bible. When you go through the hall of faith, <clears throat> you're hearing God over and over and over. You're saying, see what that one did? That's faith. See what that one did? That's faith. See what that? And God's saying, this is faith. This is faith. This is how we're supposed to live our lives. We're supposed to walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. Any good amens on that? Yeah. So <clears throat> realize that the two key things about us understanding faith to change our world, how to live this life of faith is one, we got to understand what it is. We've got to truly have an understanding of what God says in the Bible faith is. Number two, we then have to do what? Learn how to develop it. As we've been going through this series, and really at the start, we touched a lot on how we develop our faith. But as you learn about what faith is, a part of understanding as a child of God, how to develop your faith is looking at these examples of what faith is, and then just simply acting on those examples. Because a lot of people don't realize a key aspect of faith is just doing what faith does. Because if you keep doing what faith does, your faith is going to get stronger. Your faith is going to become more sure in, in relationship to walking with God and walking out what God has for you. Because faith without some corresponding action is really not faith at all. So realize this is important for us. Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> by way of quick review, let's go through a couple things because this series is so important. I mean... Truly to me, in all the aspects of what I've learned as a, as a believer and as a pastor walking with God for now, you know, literally going on right at 40 plus years of my life, you got to realize the two most key elements for New Testament saints, really, renewal of the mind and faith. You learn how to renew your mind to who you are, learn how to walk by faith, and I'll tell you, you got the two biggest things mastered in your life as a believer to walk out. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is... What? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So let's see how good I've taught you. Maybe I hopefully maybe show that I've actually accomplished something to help you out. If not, I need to get better as a teacher. So literally in context to what this verse says, faith is a substance of things hoped for. So what's hope? Hope is a goal setter. <clears throat> Where do we find hope? Word of God. We find out what our God says as to what he has already promised to do in our life or has done. And now we have a goal. Now we know what we can actually live out. So that's where the goal starts. But then we got to actually get a hold of that goal with what? Faith. Faith brings what? Substance to what we hope for. So faith has two elements. Even though it is spiritual, it is not physical. It still is a substance because the spirit realm, truthfully, is more real than the natural realm. You're going to see that in eternity. Because reality is all the natural realm came out of the spiritual realm. So faith is a substance. Say it is a substance. And it's also what? Evidence. Say it is evidence. What's an evidence of? What I can't see yet. Faith is an evidence that what God has said is already so. And that's what faith helps me to see. Verse 2. For by it. Say by it. The elders did what? They obtained a good testimony. If you want a good testimony with God. Guess what you're going to have to learn to do? Walk by faith. Only those who walk by faith are going to have a good testimony with God. But faith is a really challenging thing when you begin to understand it from the Bible's perspective because we kind of get caught up in thinking we can walk out faith and yet still see things from a natural standpoint. No. Faith takes you beyond the sense realm. Faith takes you beyond the sense realm. We walk by faith, not by 
Faith takes you beyond the sense realm. You don't go when you're walking by faith by what you see, what you hear, what you feel. No, you go by what clearly God said. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed or brought into existence by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So we see a clear connection to faith as words. We clearly see that a major connection to faith is words. The worlds were framed by the word, by the word of God, through faith. Verse 4, then he begins to define to us, based on all these different people in this, what we call the hall of faith. And believe me, there's a whole lot more. When you get into the latter part of Hebrews chapter 11, how many know that the Bible says that time would fail us to try to go through all the different people? that you can learn about the Bible that obviously walk by faith. But these are the key elements God wanted us to see. Hebrews 11, 4 is the first one. By faith, Abel did what? He offered to God a more what? Excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, through it, he being dead still speaks. So what is the first definition, according to God, of what faith is? It's an excellent sacrifice. This refers to our giving. <clears throat> what we do in our giving. So realize clearly, as the Bible you know, bears this out, and we already taught on this, the Bible proves the fact that a big key to us walking by faith has to do with what our finances are being, what we're doing with our finances, what are being done with our finances. So clearly you and I are supposed to understand if we walk by faith, we have no problem giving to what God says we're to give to and what we're supposed to do with our finances because we trust God with that. Amen? Verse 5, the second key thing we looked at, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and he was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken, he had this testimony. Enoch had a testimony that he what? Please God. Well, that means he did what? He walked by faith. So you go back and you learn in the context of what actually is talked about about Enoch in the Old Testament and this is what the Bible tells us about Enoch in the Old Testament. You ready? Enoch walked with God and Enoch was no more. So number two, if you're going to walk by faith, what are you going to have to do? You have to walk with God. If you're not walking with God, you're certainly not going to walk by faith because you're not going to get to know the very one that you're supposed to be putting your trust in. It goes on to say here in verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those who what? So if you're not getting rewarded by God, you must not be diligently seeking him because he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So what is the reward? Anybody know? God himself. God himself. Now, I want to just make a quick little side note about verse 6. You don't ever as a believer need to try to convince anybody God exists. Never, ever, never. When the devil tries to get you in a conversation with somebody that they're saying, well, you better prove to me God exists, you tell them, I don't have any such responsibility to prove to you God exists. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, for you to come to God, you must believe that he is. Not because I convinced you. You got to believe he is. If you don't believe he is, I can't help you. You're, you're damned for eternity because you simply won't accept the fact that God is. I love a little guy came to Brother Hagin in a meeting and he said, you need to prove to me God is. He said, no, I don't. And he quoted this verse. And after he literally told him that, the little old guy just stormed off mad, you know. Well, there's God. He just took off. Next night after the meeting, he catches him again trying to go out the side door. The little man runs in front of him. You need to prove to me there's a God or if I go to hell, my life is on your hands. He said, no, it ain't. He said, you yourself can't come to God unless you believe he is. He said, you're the one with the problem. Because if you're going to come to God, you can't do it unless you believe he is. So you don't believe he is, therefore, guess what? You can't come to my God. So you're going to hell in that case if you don't turn around and change. And that has nothing to do with me. That has to do with whether you believe God is or not. He stormed off again. He didn't like that. He was mad. He took off. And so a couple of uh, services went by. He came back up there, big smile on his face, chuckling. He said, you know, I've been thinking about what you said. He said, you know what? You're right. He said, I can't come to God unless I really do believe he is. He said, I can't believe I'm the one that thought you were responsible to tell me that. He said, there ain't no verse in the Bible that tells me I'm responsible to prove to you that God exists. You must believe he is. Amen? Yeah. Verse 7, we're moving on. By faith, Noah. Say Noah. Yeah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things yet seen, uh, things not yet seen, he moved with what? Right. Now, that, that phrase, godly fear, means reverence, reverence, excuse me, reverential submission. 
reverential submission. We talked about this on Wednesday night. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, and he did what? What did he do? Underline that. He prepared an ark. He prepared an ark for what? For the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So that was number four. What was number four? What's number four? I'm sorry, number three, I apologize. What was number three? By faith, Noah. What was number three Wednesday night? Faith is a work. Faith is a work. God tells Noah, you got to build an ark. There's a flood to come. Never seen a flood. Never had any idea what a flood was. And had no knowledge and took him. I mean, again, stop and think about this aspect of faith in Noah. Any idea how hard it was to build this actual ship that took 100 years to build? Any idea the labor, the time, the, 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 the aspect of what you would have to do physically to get up every day, go to work, start you know, working on this art? I mean, imagine the massive, a football and a half, a football and, and a half, take a football field and another half of one, football field and a half long. Three stories. I mean, the one in, uh, where, where's, where's that one? Where's it at? Tennessee. Up in Tennessee, they've made a replica. Kentucky, huh? Kentucky. They've made a replica based on the Bible of what actually it looked like. And guess what? They've now found, uh, the, the Noah's, they found Noah's Ark. It's on Mount Ararat, right? Where the Bible said it rested when it came back. So uh, came when the flood disappeared. So realize this. Noah had to do what? He had to go to work for God. What are we supposed to do? Work for God. We talked about that Wednesday night. Showed all the scriptures for that. You and I are supposed to be doing a work, being a witness, sharing our faith. Being a part of the body that God called us to. We clearly saw in 1 Corinthians 12, we're all called to what? Helps ministry. We all have a call to helps ministry to be a part of the work of God. Amen? Because that's doing what? Walking by faith. He goes on to say in verse uh, 8 now, we're going to go to number 4. Verse 8, by faith Abraham did what? He obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance which actually wound up to be Canaan land. And he went out not knowing where he was going, did not know where he was going. Nine, by faith he dwelt in that land of promise, <clears throat> as in a foreign country, dwelling in what? Yeah. I want you to remember that. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What city is that? Heaven, yeah. our eternal home. So God shows up to a guy named Abram, as we're about to see in a minute, and he tells him, I have a covenant that I want to make with you. I have a plan for your life. I have something I want to do with you, but here's what I need you to do. I need you to leave uh, this uh, area of Chaldee. I need you to come out into the wilderness with me, and I need you to walk in a relationship with me over the next amount of years so that guess what God could do? Prepare a way for Jesus to come. So Isaac, this promised son, who he had at one point finally offered on Mount Moriah, which is exactly the very place everybody mostly believes Jesus died as well, that literally he would offer up his son as a way to be able to provide an opportunity for God cutting covenant with Abraham to bring Jesus to be able to die for us. So you got to realize that what Abraham was asked to do, you ready? Abraham was asked to go on a journey with God. <clears throat> Faith is a journey with God. Faith is a journey with God. Sounds simple, sounds pretty easy, but when you think about Abraham's life, who we're going to talk about tonight, and the example he set for us, that was a challenge. That was a challenge. God shows up to this guy who is actually living in, in that day, a very, very wealthy area on the planet. They actually were one of the only... Oh, actual uh, context of the day when he lived there, one of the only, based on architectural finds, cities that even had underground sewage systems underneath the streets. They had really nice walled city, really nice uh, buildings. He's living there, obviously, in his own home. His family's living there with him. But guess what? They, they, they clearly were not, in the context of what we see of history, a godly city. They, one of their biggest problems was they had lots of idolatry. They worshipped a lot of false gods. So realize what God's asking Abraham at the time Abram to do. You leave all the conveniences of life. 
You live all, you leave all these conveniences of life. You come on a journey with me. And that's why I told you to point out here. I want you to see it again. In verse 9, it says that he dwelt in the land of promise in a foreign country, dwelling in what? Tents. You know what Abram lived in the rest of his life? A tent. A tent. Never had another home. A tent was his home. For the rest of his life, he never built a home again to live in. He just simply lived in a tent and obeyed God and went where God told him to go. Why? God made a covenant. God provided a way for Jesus to come. When God calls you on a journey, ladies and gentlemen, I'll guarantee you what? You're not going to walk on a journey with God by faith without being willing to give some stuff up. And a lot of people today, man, they don't want to give up any conveniences of life. I mean, my goodness, most people don't want to give, the, give up the convenience of the couch or the recliner to come back to church on Sunday night. And literally, God's telling Abram, I'm going to change your world, son. You're going to come out in the wilderness. We're not going to some lush, great, wonderful, like Hawaii, you know, and oceans and all that kind. No, we're going out in the wilderness. But you're going to come out and you're going to learn to be able to walk with God and go on a journey with your God. Amen? Amen. So you and I need to understand to be able to walk in, in faith. Guess what we got to do? We got to learn to go on a journey with God. And that means giving stuff up. Abraham did not know where he was going, it said. But he, guess what? He knew who he was going with. He didn't even know where he was going. But at least he knew who, who he was going with. Go to Genesis chapter 12. You see, going on a journey uh, with God, to walk by faith is a journey with God. Going on a journey with God, you have to constantly remind yourself of who you're with, not where you're going. You got to remind yourself of who you're with, not what you have or you don't have. Because what you got is the one you're actually going on the journey with, and that's all you need. Say, if I got God, got all I need. Think about Jesus. When Jesus, you know, stepped out in his earthly ministry at the age of 30, from that time on, he never had a home. He never owned a home. He stayed in people's homes most of the time, or they slept out outside, obviously. But Jesus, the Son of God himself, never even owned a home. I didn't tell you it's, it's wrong to own a home. It's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about everybody's journey is different, but you're not going to truly walk on a journey with God and get everything you want. It don't work that way. But you know how many people are in a position where God's wanting them to actually do things, wanting to actually take them a direction that he desires for their life, but they're unwilling to give up stuff. You know, I'm going to use my testimony as a part of that tonight. Genesis chapter 12. So let's go back here and actually read the account of the initial, you know, uh, the, uh, initial uh, uh, time that they got together in Genesis 12, God with Abram, at the time Abram, not Abraham, and what he asked him to do. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out from your country. Get out from where? So number one, you're coming out from your comfort zone of surroundings. You're going to move away from the very place that obviously you've been for years and you're very familiar with. You got to leave your Walmart behind. You got to leave your, your, your uh, mall behind. You got to leave all your little stores and shops and things that you want to do. Your Starbucks and your, and your steakhouses and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to go out in the desert, man, out where all the rats live. Get out of your country. Notice this. Get out from where? Your family. Now, I don't, I'm not telling you that you got to get away from all your family, but I'm going to tell you this. You're going to find out in a minute why that was important for Abraham and why it's still important for some of us today. So now he's saying you're not just going to leave the country that you live. Guess what you're also going to leave? You're going to leave your entire family behind. Now, if you want to know why, and I'll give you this note up front, in Joshua 24.2, if you want to make a note of that, in Joshua 24.2, Terah was Abraham's, Abram's dad. And in Joshua 24, 2, we find out he was a worshiper of idols. Not only was he a worshiper of idols, so was the rest of Abram's family. You want to know why he got him away from Abram? Wrong influence. Serving false gods. See, a lot of people won't even, in a context to not having a continual influence of family, a lot of people won't even pull aside from family that are wrongly influencing them because of the family connection. Well, pastor, you know, I'd love to come to your church, but I got family. You know, I've been living here for a long time. Then you'll never journey with God. He said, you got to get out from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. He didn't show them before they got there. He just said, I'm going to show you when I take you on that journey. Verse 2, I will make you what? A great nation. 
So if you're walking with God, how do you obviously see this in the perspective of a journey with, with uh, God? God's going to help me to do great things for him. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I mean, you know, all that's come to pass. When he talked about his descendants being like the multitudes of the sea, uh, of the sand on the sea or the stars in the sky. You're part of that. You're part of that fulfillment of which has come to pass. Amen. Amen. Verse 3, notice this. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Say, I'm blessed because of Abraham. (laughs) You know why you're blessed because of Abraham? Because he was a man of faith. Because he chose to obey God and do what God directed him to do. Leave his country, leave his family behind. And in this case, I mean, if you think about it, in the sense of the light of the New Testament, God the Father was going to pastor him. God the Father was going to shepherd him, be a father to him, take care of him. So again, he clearly goes on to say in verse 4, Abram then did what? He departed. He departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Notice this. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were there in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord. And he called on the name of the Lord. Verse 9. So Abraham journeyed. In other word, again, context for journeyed would be that he himself had a pilgrimage with God. But I like the word journey, easier for us to understand. So Abraham did what? Journeyed, going on still toward the south. And of course, then we see the fulfillment as he's gone through Egypt. He eventually winds up going into Canaan land where God promised him to go to. In relationship to what we know, that Canaan land became the promised land of the children of Israel after they came out of, out of Egypt. He fulfilled his promise to give that promised land to his people. So let's go through a couple notes here real quick. First of all, to take faith's journey through life with God, you got to be willing to do what? Give up things. If you're going to, if you're going to walk by faith, you're going to have to give up some things. So let me use myself as an example. I started walking with God at the age of 25, 25 I got born again. Age of 25, didn't know anything about Jesus till I got to that point in my life. Now, knew, found out about Jesus, got born again. And I obviously started in a relationship with God. I didn't realize what God had planned for my life. Guess what my plan for my life was? <clears throat> Bull riding. Anybody know that? My plan was to go full-time in the rodeo world, of course, to be able to do that as a full-time uh, job for me, eventually, hopefully, make the national finals, become a world champion. That was my dream. For 16 years, I pursued it, did everything I could to make that happen. But guess what? God had different plans. And when I got born again and started walking with God, God, I came to Texas. I, m- I mentioned this like I told uh, Charlotte. God can do things in your life to rearrange you to get you where you need to be if you have a heart to on- honestly serve him. I wanted to serve God because I was so grateful for what God did to obviously give me a relationship. I never knew you could have a relationship with God. And when I found out you could, I was overwhelmed. I was just totally blown away. When I told Coy that night in the wrestler's house, like you can really know God? Yeah, you can know him. Well, I was so grateful that I want to do whatever I could for God. So I am learning, developing, growing all that I can in my walk with God. I come to Texas. I literally believe this all in my heart. Even though I thought I was pursuing a bull riding career, I think God was directing me obviously here for the purpose that he had, clearly, of which I didn't know about at the time. It wasn't like I had a word from God. Hey, I want you to come to the wilderness of Texas, praise the Lord. Not like it's a wilderness, but, you know. But I came here pursuing a bull riding career. But as I got here and started walking with God, all of a sudden as time went on, God brings me into this place where I'm at a church where all of a sudden that church disappears. And now we're believing God for a church. And Coy, used by God, prophesies this church into existence. 
Coy turns to me and Kathy at the meeting, and he said, would you start it? Didn't say, would you pastor it? Some of you know that testimony. I don't have time to give that whole testimony tonight. I said, sure, I'll, I'll get it started. So we thought, wonderful, God's provided us a church. Since we're losing our other church, God's providing us a church. And lo and behold, for the first three months, I couldn't get anybody to come speak. I'm the one, obviously, teaching every Sunday morning to those that were coming as we started our church in Keller, Texas, downtown Keller, Texas, in a little building there. And so basically, as time goes on over those three months, guess what I start losing a desire for? Bull riding. But my flesh still wanted to do it. I didn't want to give it up. I still rode bulls for two years after I started pastoring. In 92, I finally realized I don't need to be doing this anymore because this isn't what God's called for me to do. So long, long, long story short, I gave up a 16-year devotion. Think about that. 16 years of my life. Any idea how much time, money, and effort was devoted into actually trying to make a, a, a career out of bull riding in my life? I gave up all 16 years of that to obey God and to go on a journey with God to become a pastor of a church. <clears throat> Are you listening? Yes. And I had to be willing to give up something that at the time I didn't realize was really a God to me. Amen. And a lot of Christians don't realize how many things they hold on to that are gods to them. Mm-hmm. Family members, etc. And so I told the Lord, I will be obedient. I'm willing to do this. And so obviously I laid all that down and I chose to simply give my life to what God called for me to do. Now, since that's happened in my life and this time has gone on, I, you can ask Kathy, of all the extracurricular activities that I do every single week, because you all think pastors just do all this other stuff during the week, right? <laughs> Golf course, you know, pretty much four or five days a week, <clears throat> all this other stuff. I can't tell you the last time I've done anything other than go out with her to dinner and, and you know, as far as extra, th- because my life is consumed with ministry. Amen. My life is consumed with the call of God of my life because it goes beyond pastoring. Thank I don't look at that as some big sacrifice. I look at that as a way that I can gratefully show Jesus that I'm so grateful for what he did for me that I get to honor his life by being a part of helping others to know him. Walk in what he has for their life. But it has called for me to make, in a sense, uh, and it's not, to me it's not a sacrifice. The bull riding thing was at first, but then I realized God was right. I'd made a, I'd made a God out of this in my life. And that broke my heart because I didn't want anything in my life between me and God. Amen. And I didn't realize that I really still did have that between me and God. But all of a sudden I had to realize I got to give up this dream of mine so I can obey God and go on this journey with God. Do what God wants me to do. Amen. Amen. I didn't see it as a journey at the time, but I do now. And for a lot of people, they may not think that's a big deal. Let me help you, man. I'll guarantee you what, going into ministry is a challenge. Doing ministry, even when you're called, I guarantee you, like I've told you before, there's a lot of times I wanted to quit. You look at Abram's life walking with God as he walked through all this stuff in Egypt and stuff. He even lied about his wife. I mean, there's times you want to quit, but you know what? You got to be willing to keep obeying God, keep moving forward. And so I gave up all that for the purpose of simply doing what? Going on a journey with God so I could walk out what God had for my life. Now, clearly in the context of a ministry calling, you need to know that you have that calling, but you also need to have ministers above you, right, that know that you have that calling in the fivefold ministry. I want to add to that something else. In my now 33 years of being a pastor, I, with technology and people that watch us and stuff, I can't tell you many people have said, I get more out of your teaching than my own church. Amen. I hear this consistently. I watch you all the time. I listen to your message all the time. I don't have a church where I live to hear, hear any of this stuff. You know what I tell those people? What are you doing there? Right. Well, but this is where my family lives. Hello, Abram. Come on. This is where my home's at. I've lived here for years. Right. What does that have to do with walking by faith? So if you're going to obey God and do what God's called you to do, you're going to continue to live in a, in a little town you've lived in or whatever place you've lived in because your family lives there and you lived there all your life and that's where your grandkids are and all that kind of stuff. Well, hey, now you're messing with me, you know, to the degree you don't want to be talking to me like that because I ain't leaving my grandkids. Okay, then you're not going to walk by faith because if God calls you to do so, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to obey him. That's right. Come on. Good work. Thank you for all your amens about that. See, first and foremost, my devotion is to God above everything else. And as long as I'm obeying God, it doesn't matter about what's going on in the natural. Guess what? I'm going to get to spend all eternity with those people. Hallelujah. 
That doesn't mean everybody has to leave where their grandkids are. I'm just telling you, I know people, I know people who said, I'm telling you, I never have heard teaching like this. I really connect with you. How many know that's a sign? How many know what the Bible reveals? That you know your shepherd. Uh, you don't know in your heart there's a connection, right? And these people talk all the time about how they wish they had a church. I sure wish you'd move up here. Sure wish you'd, well, God didn't call me there. He called me, in Pond, he called me to Ponder, Texas, praise God. Guess what you need to do? You need to move to Ponder, Texas. You need to be like Abram and be willing to leave your family. See, think about, just think about that aspect of obedience to God. So most of you have been in this church long enough to know, do we look for a church? No, we are the church. According to the Bible, 100% proven by the Bible over and over and over again. What do we look for? We look for our shepherd. So once we find our shepherd, what have we found? We found the most valuable gift God's given to us to help us grow in God and walk in God. But see, the devil has convinced Christians you don't look for a pastor, you look for a church. So what you do is you just keep looking for something in your area where you live because you happen to live there. That's where your job is and all your family is and all that kind of stuff. I I totally applaud people like Shelly and and Charlie Long. You know, Charlie Long and I met years ago at a a meeting down in South Texas. The church he was at was much like the one I went to. The pastor himself has acknowledged again and again and again he's an evangelist. He's an evangelist. Charlie would tell me all the time, I listen to you all the time. I get way more out of your teaching. And I'm telling you, I just know you're my shepherd. I know you are. And me and Shelly are going to find a way to get up there, praise God, because I know that's where God wants me. He's willing to uproot from where he's been, place that he's lived, where he's been for years, and to be able to come and be able to connect with this pastor. Not a lot of people are willing to do that. But faith is what? It's a journey with God. What is faith? A journey with God. If you're going to go on a journey with God, let me help you again. You're going to have to learn to give some things up. You're not going to walk with God and get everything you want. Because you want to know something? There's some things that you may want. God doesn't want you to have. God knows those are a detriment to your life. So again, clearly, to take faith's journey through life with God, you've got to be willing to give things up. And there, as I've mentioned before, uh, coming out from his family had to do with, again, his father and even the rest of his family serving other gods. I want you to get this. The natural man, say the natural man. So that's the old fleshly nature. That's why I said this series on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights ties right into our identity series. Because if I'm walking under my old identity, what's, what's governing me? The natural man. If I'm walking by my new identity, what's governing me? My spirit man. I want you to get this statement. The natural man seeks security in what one has or sees. The natural man seeks security in what that one has or sees. As a context of living out my life from the natural perspective, what do I seek security in? What I have or what I can see. But that's not walking by faith. See, if you're just going to try to find security in what you have or in what you see, you're never going to obey God. Because faith goes beyond what you see. Abram was told to go out there with God, and guess what? Did not even get told where he was going. Didn't even get told the destination. I just want you to come with me. Amen? This is powerful. Write this down. Faith seeks security in God. Faith seeks security in God. The natural man seeks security in what one has or sees, but faith doesn't. Faith seeks security in God. So if, my, if I'm walking by faith and therefore I'm seeking my security in God, what am I willing to do? Whatever God tells me. Whatever God tells me, I'm willing to do. And realize when we say whatever God tells you, you got to always plug this in there. That doesn't mean you just do whatever you think God tells you contrary to the word of God. Because clearly God would never direct you or lead you contrary to the word of God. So even in relationship to the context of a church, you got to know that not only you know you're called, but your pastor knows you're called there. Right. Amen? But once you know that, guess what? And now that God's got you connected where obviously he wants you. Satan don't want you there. He's going to do everything he can to uproot you. But a lot of people today, do you understand any idea how many Christians today, most of you know these prophecies, okay? Doesn't the Bible say in the last days there'll be so many teachers you can heap them up? But those teachers are doing what? What are they doing? <coughs> Tickling itching ears, right? But how many know there's an Old Testament prophecy that says in the last days, how many believe you're there? Yes. There'll be a famine of the word. Yeah, right. A famine of true teaching of the word of God. Just the basic truth of what God's word says. So if there's a famine of that, obviously in the land, how many realize that most people probably aren't getting fed the truth of God's word? Right. Right. 
And it's sad to see how many people are unwilling to honor, actually honor God and do this God's way and give things up of security so that they can walk out what God has for a journey for their life. I mean, I think of Summerall. Dr. Summerall, after pastoring for a handful of years as a very young man, I mean, all of a sudden God tells him, I want you to go to the foreign nations I'm calling you to, to go out and be a missionary. Guess how much money he had in his pocket when he got on the boat to leave the country? Twelve bucks. Twelve dollars. Say faith Faith. is a journey journey. with God. God. Guess what he gave up? All his security, everything he had here. He had twelve bucks in his pocket, but guess what he had? He had God. What was his faith dependent on? God. And when he left to go off, off in his first uh, missionary journey, he was over uh, getting on a ship over in California, a big church over there. He knew, uh, had known of the pastor. He had gone to the church for a few days before he left. And the pastor said, I'll take you to the ship tomorrow because I want to talk to you a little bit. So he takes him to the ship and they're about to, he's about to get on the ship. And the pastor says to him, he said, so who's sending you around the world? Uh, my big brother is. Your big brother? Yeah. Well, like, you mean what, what church, big brother? What? No, no churches are sending me. No churches are sending you? Nope. See, back in his day, very common, you didn't go out unless some church sent you. Obviously, that they're saying, hey, we want you to go do this. We want you to go do that. But did God call him? Did God tell him to go? He said, Jesus, clearly, I have no doubt God, that God told me without 100%, I'm to go and obey him and go into the context of the world where he's calling me to go preach the gospel. He said, you have no support of any church at all in America. No. Well, who's your support? My big brother. Amen. He said, all you young ministers say that. He said, you're going to die over there. He said, you're going to die. They're not even going to be able to find your bones. No telling where you're going to wind up, where they're going to bury you. He said, but I guarantee you what, you'll never come back to America. He said, well, sir, he said, I want you to do me one favor. He said, what's that? He said, you have a gravestone made out and have put on that gravestone. Here lies Lester Summerall, a man who died trusting God. He said, I won't do it. He said, and I won't need it. (laughs) And he left. And he literally turned the world where he went upside down. Amen. Should say turned it right side up. And God provided him in miraculous ways. And when he came back, guess who the first pastor was he actually ran into? That pastor. Right. And when he ran into that pastor, that pastor, that, I thank God for this. That pastor apologized, man. He repented to him and said, I'm so sorry. He said, you're such a wonderful man of faith. He said, here I was saying all these bad things about you. I could at least give you an offering. I had the ability to do it. And I didn't do it because I just thought you were just being arrogant and you were just beyond your means and didn't know what you were doing. But you were trusting God. Amen. And you proved it. And you've changed literally thousands of lives. He said, you are truly a man of faith. You are truly a man of faith. So you got to understand this. I mean, even after he came back to America, he started a church initially in, uh, in uh, Indiana. And the first church he started, he built up a congregation, got this church going. He was pastoring it for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. He's now in his 50s. I think he's like 55. And at 55, God says, I need you to go over to this other continent. I need you to go over there where they need the gospel preached. And he said, okay, Lord, whatever you want me to do. Guess what he did? He sold everything he had, sold his home. He gave all his cars away, gave all that he had in context to possessions away other than just some clothes to put in a suitcase. Thank God he had a wife that knew how to walk by faith. When God told him that, he came downstairs. He said, honey, pack the bags. Why? He said, we're leaving the country. What, just like for a trip? No, we're gone. We're selling everything we got. He said, we've got people in the church we can turn the church over to. God told me to go. I'm going to go. Okay, I'm with you. And guess what? He went. And he obeyed God. And he got in that foreign land. And that church is still in existence today. And has won over a million souls. <laughs> Tell me that ain't worth it. You know why? He went over there. He, he said, if you just saw the apartment I lived in, most of you probably would have turned right around and headed back home. He said, but I didn't care. I was obeying God. Amen. So, ladies, guess what? Abram and his wife and their kids, after he had his kids, guess where they lived the rest of their life? In tents. Say, are you willing to give up your house and go live in a tent? I'm just joking. Some of you are like, really? Like I got No, not likely you're going to have you do that today. But guaranteed, you got to do what? You got to be willing to obey God. Amen. Amen? Human security and dependence will destroy faith. Human security and dependence will destroy faith. These are Lester Summerall quotes. Human security 
and dependence will destroy faith. If you're going to rely on what you desire for security and dependence as a human with your flesh, it'll destroy your faith. It'll destroy your faith. So if you were to go to Abraham and say, Abraham, what is faith? You know what Abraham would tell you? It's complete dedication to God. Complete dedication to God. How do you go on a journey of uh, faith with God? You completely dedicate yourself to God. And whatever he tells you to do, you're willing to do. How about some New Testament verses? Luke 14. Go with me to Luke 14. If you're going to walk on this journey with God, guess what you're going to have to learn to do? Start getting out of your little comfort zone. Start being obedient to what God tells you to do. So here's one. I guarantee you this is black and white. We saw it Wednesday night in doing a work for God. Didn't the Bible tell us to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Does that mean you have to leave Texas to go into all the world to preach the gospel? No, go into your world. Right? How many believe that we're supposed to be those who truly do share the gospel and win souls and do the work of God? How many believe we're supposed to do that? How many believe we clearly have a mandate in the Bible to do that? That's part of our journey. That's part of our journey with God. But the average person hasn't even talked to their next door neighbor about their walk with God or whether they know God, let alone witness to anybody else. You know what God needs today? He needs people walking by faith. Because the people like the Summerall's who obeyed God and went out and did the things they did, we now hear of all their testimonies of the great things God did and say, wow, wow, that's cool. I'd like to have some of those testimonies. Well, it's simple. Walk by faith. Journey with God. Be obedient to what God tells you to do. And you don't have to go to a foreign nation to see it happen. Amen. How about laying hands on the sick people around you? Right. Good. Amen? Amen? Are we being obedient to our journey of faith where God's called us to in relationship to what we do as a church, what we do as an individual in our daily life. Because God wants to use us right where we are. Hallelujah. I think of Terry Mize. You know, Terry Mize and T.L. Osborne's stories are really, really similar. Because the very first time Terry obeyed God to go obviously do what God called him to go and do in a foreign land, they were, he was in an area where there were no clothes. There were no stores to buy anything. If you didn't kill something that day or catch something that day, you didn't eat. He almost died. He contracted, what did he get? Yellow fever or something. I mean, he almost died. Till Osborne almost died. You know why? Because he honestly didn't know how to exercise his faith in, a, in the aspect of what he was dealing with that was coming against him. He was just obeying God what God told him to do. So did Till Osborne. But guess what? The next time he went, things were different. Right. Now he had learned some stuff and knew what to do about that stuff. Praise God. And I guarantee you, walking by faith and obeying God doesn't mean everything goes perfect. You listening? Sometimes walking by faith, you actually miss it and you goof up and you stumble. But guess who's right there to pick you up and help get you through it? God is. God is. And that's how some of the times what you aspect of, of walking by faith, that's how some of the aspects of what you do walking by faith, you learn from God. You learn what you obviously need to do. Luke 14, 25. You know what God needs more than ever in the last days? He needs a New Testament church that will be obedient to him to share their faith. Pray about ideas and ways God wants to use me to do that and how I can facilitate making that happen through my life. Amen. Look, if you're waiting for, the, for us, the church, to give you all kinds of ideas of what to do or things we're supposed to do, you're, you're not obeying God. God's going to tell me as a church what we need to do. That don't take away what God can use you to do. Because God still wants you to use you in ways to reach people with the gospel. Amen? Amen. Luke 14, one of the ideas God recently gave me, now I don't know for sure if we're going to do this or not, praying about it. I got to find out more about it. How many know the new movie that just came out, Jesus Revolution? This month it gets released to be shown publicly through people like us. Well, we may do a movie night in the park like we've done and do it with Jesus Revolution. But if we do that, guess what that means? That means my pastor has heard from God. This is now a responsibility for us as a church. And if that happens, my priority becomes to be a part of that. So I can be a part of helping make that happen and be here to minister to people and love on people. Well, I'm just not comfortable doing that. Then you'll never walk with God. Because you're going by your comfort zone of your flesh and what your flesh wants. And again, if you're going to walk by faith, you're going to have to do what? You're going to have to get out of your flesh and be obedient to God. Watch this. Luke 14, 25. Great multitudes went with him, Jesus. And he turned and he said to them, verse 26, if anyone. Who? Anyone. So this applies to who? Anyone. 
anyone. If anyone comes to me, that means obviously you're coming to receive him as your, as your Lord and Savior, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, his what? Own life also, he cannot be what? So if you think about it, walking by faith under the New Testament would also be the same as being what? A disciple of Jesus. Yes. Is everybody who's born again a disciple of Jesus? Yeah. No. No. We're going to read to you just a handful. There's more than this. But these are things Jesus said are a must to be a disciple. He didn't say to be born again. He said to be a disciple. Right. Right. If you're a disciple of Jesus, guess what you are? You're on a journey of faith. Because the disciple of Jesus is doing whatever the, the actual one that he's learning from, the teacher of what he's learning from that he wants him to do. I'm just simply the student. And I'm willing to do, come on, think about, the, how about the Karate Kid days? Anybody see the very first Karate Kid movie? Raise your hand if you saw the first Karate Kid movie. So, right. So, he wants to learn, right? He wants to learn this karate. And so, he gets hooked up with Mr. Miyagi. And what's the first thing Mr. Miyagi do? He gets him over to his house. He says, hey, come out here. I want you to wax my car. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute. I, I want to learn karate. No, you come wax my car. Come on. And so, he takes him out there and he shows him how to do it. This is what you do. Wax on. <laughs> wax on. Wax on, wax off, right? So he's thinking, well, so, okay, I'll, you know in his head what he's thinking. I'll wax the old man's car, and, you know, if I do that, at least maybe he'll finally allow me the privilege to be able to learn a little bit, you know, of karate from him at some point that I'll be able to understand more about karate. He didn't realize that he's being trained in the midst of what he's doing. See, you don't realize a lot of times what God's asking you to do. God, in the midst of what he's asking you to do, is help him train you for what he needs you to do. So you're seeing it from the natural. But God's not. Amen. God's got a spiritual purpose for everything he asks you to do. How about paint the fence, right? So then he gets some whacked in the car. <laughs> oh, you did good on the car. Come here, come here. <laughs> Gives him a brush. Paint the fence. Paint the fence. Paint the fence. <laughs> right? But how many you know, at the end of the movie, all that, all that came into play, didn't it? See, so many Christians are unwilling to be uncomfortable, challenged, and not be somebody who's just doing what the flesh wants. You still here? I'm telling you, folks, you better get beyond this thing about not wanting to witness to people and not being bold to step out in the day you live in and start witnessing to people. Because if you're not witnessing to people, you're not walking by faith. You're not on this journey with God. All under the New Testament are called to go out and share their faith. Not just ministers. Amen. Amen. So if you come to Jesus, but you don't hate your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and even your own life, obviously if you do not hate those in context of Jesus, you can't be a disciple. So we know, we've taught it before, he, God doesn't want you to hate your dad, doesn't want you to hate your mom. The word is a bad translation. He said, you got to love them less. Right. Meaning what? You can't love anybody more than you love me. <clears throat> Abram, believe your father. Leave your mother, leave your brothers, leave your sisters, leave them all behind. Leave your own comfort of your own life also. And love me more than all of that. And come walk with me on a journey of faith. I don't believe this context of the day in which we are, even in heaven, I don't believe Abraham for one moment regrets, regrets his decision to honor God and obey God. How I many know that's the facts? So realize he had to be willing to do what? He had to be willing to love God more than any person on the planet. You are not going to walk in a faith journey with God if you don't love God more than people. That's right. Well, I thought we're supposed to love people through God. Amen. But if you don't love God more than people, you know what happens? I mean, it happens all the time. I've watched it for years as a pastor, you know. You'll get in a situation where a husband will come to church, but the wife won't. The wife will come to church. Or excuse me. The husband uh, won't come to church because the wife won't. The wife won't come to church because the husband won't. Well, what's that all about? Well, they can't go. I can't go. Who said? Right. Who said because they're not there, you're, you can't go? Come on. Right. Does that mean you're not supposed to be at church that night? Come on. No, Amen. Amen. How about your own life? Where, are you willing? Was I willing to give up 16 years of investment into something that I did not want to give up and I wanted to really do? Was I willing to lay that down and love God more? Then I love bull riding? Yes. yes. Are you willing to lay down whatever God asks you to lay down to love him more? Yes. To do what he's called you to do? How about your pride? Hallelujah. <laughs> 
27, moving on. Whoever does not do what? Bear his cross and come after me cannot do what? Be my disciple. Cannot. Cannot be my disciple. If I love anybody more than him, can't be his disciple. If I'm unwilling to bear my cross, can't be his disciple. So I've taught you, what does it mean to bear, bear your cross? <clears throat> Fulfill God's will for your life. Bearing your cross doesn't mean to die because Jesus literally, in essence, denied self in the garden before he ever got to the cross. Amen? He, he was dead in the sense of his decision to go do what God called him to do before he ever got to the cross. In that t- time frame of three hours in the garden, he's having to go through all this agony to choose to do what? Not my will, Father. Your will be done. What was his will? Go to that cross, son. What's bearing your cross? Take up the will of God for your life. Take up the will of God to do what he's called you to do, to walk out what he's called you to do, and obviously do it with all your might. And if you do, you're on a faith journey with God. But I will promise you, you're not going to take up the will of God and not lay down some things that you want to do. Amen? Amen. If you have certain things, and even relating to stuff God wants you to do as it relates to ministry, and you keep saying, but I don't have time to do that. You know why? Because you're not willing to lay down other things. To obey God and do what God told you to do. You got to realize I got to be willing to give up some other things that maybe I really didn't want to give up so I can obey God and do what God wants me to do. 28, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and do what? Count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to do what? They mock him, saying this man began to build and he was not able to finish. 31, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit sit down first and do what? Consider, consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. 32, or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. All he's talking about in these verses is you got to be willing to count the cost and consider what it's going to cost you to walk with God and be willing to give it up. How do you know? Next verse. So Notice this. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all. Does not forsake all that he has cannot be what? Cannot be my disciple. See, to be a disciple, you got to count the cost. That means what? So in our day, this doesn't mean right now go sell everything you got, give everything away, and just give everything you got to God, to Jesus. No. It's saying you got to be willing. Say willing. You got to be willing to do what? Forsake anything in your life. Let it go. Let it go. Lay it down. If it's going to hinder you in fulfilling what God has called for you to do in your journey with him. If you're going to walk out your journey with him. So we're back to what I was talking about in relationship to church life. How many people are clearly in a church they shouldn't be in? How many people are going to churches simply because it's tradition? My family went there. It's where I live. Find a verse that, that says anywhere in Scripture, this is what determines. How many of you know we said, saw this on, on Wednesday night, 1 Corinthians 12? Who puts me within the body God wants me in? The Father, the Father does. God puts us in the body where he wants us, if we obey. Right. Isn't that right? Yes. So if God puts me in the body where he wants us, where is there a verse that says I determine where I go to church by where I live? Or where my family's at? Or where my job's at? There's people that are unwilling to give up jobs. Well, I've had this job a long time. But are you actually walking in obedience to what God wants you to do and where God wants you? Because clearly, if you are not, guess what? You're not on this journey of faith. God has so much more for you that you don't realize. Amen? Amen. I remember this story Brother Hagin shared about a guy in his church when he was still pastoring. This guy said, Brother Hagin, uh, we're leaving the church. Well, what's wrong, man? You're here all the time. Like, so, oh, no, 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 no. No, I have had a company offer me a better job. This is coming out of depression days. They've offered me a job of better pay, better benefits, all this kind of stuff. But it's in this other, it's in this other town, and it's quite a ways away, so we're going to have to move. He said, oh. He said, have you considered what church you're going to go to and what pastor you're going to have? Well, no. You haven't? No. You don't think that's important? Well, I never really thought about it. He said, I have a question for you. He said, didn't your son get healed in this church? Yeah. Didn't your marriage get fixed in this church? Yeah. Didn't God help you understand how to grow in God and become a disciple and walk in the things of God in your life that you didn't know before you came here? Yeah. You're going to give all that up to just chase the job. Have you even prayed about it, son? Well, I didn't really think about praying about it. Well, maybe that might be a good idea. Because you know what most people are doing? They're just going after the bigger paycheck. Seems to make sense. You listening? 
And so guess what he did? He prayed about it. Came back several weeks later, said, you know what, Brother Hagin? My wife and I prayed about that. We got to thinking about it. We thought, you know what? We don't want to do without our church. We don't want to do without our pastor. We don't want to do without the things we've been taught by God. No, nope, we're going to stick it out here. And within months, having obeyed God and stayed with his pastor and stayed in his church, guess what God did? He blessed him with a brand new job with better pay than the other place would have given him and better benefits. <clears throat> what did he tell Abram? Follow me and I'll bless you. Follow me and I'll bless you. I remember years ago, how many remember Julie Shibe? Yeah. We called her Shibes or Jules. You know, Julie Shibe uh, was in our church. She went to obviously help her mom, take care of her mom. Julie Shibe was in our church and she lost her job. She was a court a stenographer, court reporter. Those little machines they do, you know, to, to, to do uh, obviously what's done in a, in a case of a court. And she all of a sudden loses all of her jobs. She can't find any work. They're not needing anybody anymore. Now she can't even make ends meet. She comes to me. She said, man, I've been looking everywhere for a job, but I can't find a job. I said, have you prayed about it? Well, yeah. She said, I've, I've seen this job available out of Copeland's ministry, but she said, it's working in the mail department. I wouldn't even be making enough to pay my bills. I said, pray about it. So she did. She said, you know, I don't understand it. I don't know why, but I have a piece about taking this job. I said, then take it. So she did. And I'll guarantee you, she wasn't there two, three, four weeks, just a handful of time. And all of a sudden, her supervisor comes to her and he says, uh, we understand that you're one of these stenographer court reporters. Yeah, yeah. He said, well, he said, there's another department wants to talk to you. Okay. So they send her over to this other department. She sits down with this guy in his office. He said, I just got out of a meeting with, with uh, Brother Colton. He wants to do all of our in-house closed captioning of our programs in-house. We now pay for somebody to do it outside of our ministry. We want to have somebody here do it. It's the same machine. And we understand you have all this experience in doing this. Well, yeah, I've done it for years. He said, I don't know how. You ready for this? I come out of this meeting and I don't know how. I came and sat down at my desk. I go to pick up my phone to call my secretary to, to find out, do we have anybody in the ministry who knows how to do this? And your application is sitting on my desk. I asked my secretary, did you dig this up? Did you hear about this meeting? I knew nothing about the meeting. Because he had just come out of the meeting. How'd this get on my desk? I don't know, sir. I didn't put it there. Amen. I mean, you know, angels can walk around and pull applications out of files. So long story short, he said, could you do this? Yeah. He said, I need you to tell us what you need of a salary to do this job. All she did is figure bare minimum what she needed to pay her bills. And she told him, this is what I need. He said, well, he said, we've checked into it and they get paid a lot more than that. So we're going to pay you what you would normally make if you were out in the world. We're not going to pay you less than what you'd make out in the world. And by, that, by the way, not only that, guess what? She, they created her own office because she has to have a private place to do it. I mean, I could go on and on and on about how God blessed her through that whole process of that stuff. But you know what she did? She gave up the comfort of what didn't seem like a right decision and just obeyed God. So understand, you and I in this journey of faith got to be doing, willing to do what? We got to be willing to make sure we don't love anybody more than we love Jesus. We got to be willing to do what? Take up his will no matter what it costs us to do that in the natural. And finally, we got to be willing to let go of anything, forsake all. To walk out obedience, what God wants us to walk out. I'll guarantee you the biggest thing that you got to forsake today, that's going to be the most difficult thing for you to forsake, is again, your own pride or your own view of yourself or your own unwillingness to get beyond your natural person to start stepping out in faith and obeying God and witnessing for God. Now, we talked about this last Monday night. God spoke to us to me on Monday night, and he gave me a challenge to this church that everybody in this church should commit this year to winning no less than one soul and making a disciple out of them. Now, listen, folks, I'm not the only one called to make disciples. The only way we make disciples is by all of us working together to make disciples. I can't go after every little baby Christian and make sure they're coming to church. Guess what God wants you to do when you help lead somebody to the Lord? Make sure they get to church. It's like if you go to the hospital, how many ladies went and birthed your baby and said, wonderful, praise God, we'll see you at home. And you went home and the baby just found his way home. Doesn't happen, right? <laughs> so guess what you don't do? You don't get somebody born again and not make sure they get to church. As they're a baby Christian going through the initial stages of baby Christendom, guess what you do? You make sure they get in church. You keep encouraging them. You keep loving on them. You keep praying for them. You keep checking on them. You keep continuing to encourage them and help them begin to walk out what God has for their life. Amen. Amen. 
What if everybody in this church, and believe me, if you don't think that we could do this, if there weren't, obviously, people to still be born again, Jesus would have already come. Right. What if everybody in this church won no less than one soul to the Lord this year? I don't mean just limit it to that. Oh, I got my one. I can do, I don't do anything until 2024. No, now you've learned how to do it. But what if everybody won no less than one soul to the Lord and actually got them in this church and discipled them? You know where we'd be at the end of the year? We'd be double the size we are now. And it's not about size. It's about doing what? It's about reaching those people that need to be reached and connecting with our body, those that God wants connected with our body. How many glad God connected you? So you got to realize you and I are, are very clearly, and don't do this. We're not after other Christians going to other churches. That's not our target. Our target is two people, basically. Yes, those who might be born again who are what? Unchurched. They're not in church. They've drifted away from church. They're a prodigal. They pulled away. Or clearly those who aren't born again. And if you and I will get serious about wanting to win people to the Lord, it don't mean you may not make mistakes. Some are all did. Terry Mize did. But guess what God did? He worked with them through it all and they learned from it and they got good at what they were learning to do. So realize a walk with God is also what? A journey. Uh, excuse me. Faith in God is what? A journey with God. If you're going to walk by faith, what are you going to do? You're going to go on a journey with God. And you're going to do what God called you to do. And that means I've got to be willing to give up things that I may not normally want to give up. Amen? Amen? But guess what happens in the end result? Not only do you get blessed by it, but God uses you to bless others. God did so with Abraham and he'll do so with us. Time to get obedient to God. I said time to get obedient to God. Stand to your feet. We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.